In this video, I'm going to show you how to use the new batch analysis module in the Unscrambler. I have some data here for four different batches um, of a process measuring the temperature and pressure throughout the batch. And what we want to do is we want to analyze these batches for consistency over the relative time in our batch process. So it's very straightforward to do this. We take our batch data and under tasks, analyze, we want to go down to batch modeling. And we want to do a first pass batch model. This is just to get a general idea. Um, it's basically doing a PCA and measuring this, the space um, to give us a starting point, sort of our first guess at what our model might look like. I'm going to use all of my batches and my three variables. We're going to go through and on the next page we can see that we can choose the number of batches we have. This is pulled from our batch ID, this category variable that we have. Um, if you don't want to use all of your batches you can always deselect, uh, but it's good to have all of them and it's nice you can see that these batches all have different numbers of samples and this happens very often where you've got um, one batch that runs a little bit longer than another or a little bit shorter than another, you're missing some data. And in a traditional sense of looking at batches, that would cause problems in your analysis. But with our approach, that is not necessarily a problem. So we're going to go ahead and weight our data because they are on different scales. And we want to make sure to give them uh, even weighting when we do our analysis. The default for the validation is to cross-validate across the batches, so it'll remove an entire batch, see if the other ones can predict it. We're going to go next and just leave it as the SVD. If you have any missing data, then you would have to use uh, NIPALS, of course. And finish. And this is our first patch pass of data. And as we can see, it looks very similar to our principal components analysis. I can turn on my labels for my loadings so we can take uh, a look at what the loadings are for PC1 and PC2. We use our explained variants to see that this is a two component model so we can explain our batches very well in just two components. And we can take a look at our residuals of our samples and it looks like everything is falling very well under this 95% confidence line um, except for a couple of spots at the end of the batches. We're then going to use this to build our final model. And to do that, we just go right back to tasks, analyze, batch modeling, and this time we're going to choose a trajectory model. We're going to leave all of our data the same because it's pulling it from that model. As we can see here, if you had more than one models so that would show up, it'll give you the suggested number of components, which we agreed was two. Again, we can change our batch selection if we saw in our first pass that a particular batch had um, outliers associated with it. We can remove those if we needed to. The weighting remains. Our validation is going to remain the same as well as our algorithm. And in this advanced mode, this is where you can change how you want to look at the different trajectories. Um, we can change whether you want to follow a linear approach or a spline. We're splitting these up into many different ranges, um, grids. We can choose what our grid size is. And what the grids do is they look at where you have common points in your batches in your score space. And they may, may be smaller or larger depending on um, how the algorithm works out. And it basically does a mini PCA around those individual points in the grids so that we can get our nice uh, hotel and T-squared and residual space around the points as we go through the path in the score space. I'm just going to leave it as the default for now and click finish. And now we see that we have a nice uh, score space. If we want, I can turn off my batch scores and we can see what the trajectory itself looks like. So in the center here, we have our average trajectory and our 95% confidence limits. Um, so we want our data to fall in between these as we're going through the space. 
I can turn that back on and look at my individual batches, how they fall in. And you can see they fall pretty nicely. We've got one batch here that steps out for a second and this one comes out a little bit. But as you can see, it doesn't really matter the timing of the individual data points because if something, if the reaction moves a little bit faster, then it's going to take bigger jumps through this score space. And where it's moving slower or maybe even stalled, um, you'll have a lot of points happening in one place before it moves on, um, but you still get your limits as it's in the same space that you're expecting to see. Now, once we've built our model, of course, we want to project this into our new space. Um, so I have some batches for testing here. And under tasks, predict batch projection, I can now use my batch trajectory model and choose my data. So I'm going to use this batch number six. And I can look through to make sure if there's any auto pretreatment associated with this, which there's not in this case. But if you were doing, say, spectral data and you had done an SNV or derivative, that would be included as part of the model as well. And we can check our outlier limits to see if we want warnings uh, based on different levels. We're going to finish. And we see our batch trajectory, and we can see our individual batch through this space. And as we see, we start a little bit outside of the space that we're in control. So this particular reaction um, happened a little bit slower at the beginning, and it matches that point where it catches up to the rest of them, and we can follow it in space. And we can see here it starts to go out of spec, and we can use that information to make some adjustments um, in this case, I would say it's probably this temperature B, right? We see that it is dropping down in our PC2. So something between this temperature and pressure, we can make adjustments on that and bring it back into the correct space um, so that you can have a nice controlled feedback loop on this. Um, we can also go and look at the individual contributions. So we can come through and look at our individual data point and say, hey, I know right here things are really out of whack. What is actually out of whack? And we can see here it is actually both pressure and temperature are too high in this case um, for those data points. When we come back into space, then we can see we're back to a normal level. And we can sample through all of our different space to see what the contributions are as we go through the trajectory. So all these nice interactive plots to help you understand what is going on with your data. And that's the general overview for the batch analysis using the Unscrambler.